Um, today's second Bible reading comes from us from Acts chapter 16, reading verses 25 through 34. The question of whether or not baptism saves you is clearly answered um, in this account, which will um, follow as the basis of the morning sermon. Um, we hear. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called, or called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Uh, he then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer was brought to them in his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. In the name of the Father who created us, in the name of the Son who redeemed us, in the name of the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us. Amen. The portion of God's word that we're going to focus on today was the second reading we heard from Acts chapter 16, verses 25 to 34. But as we begin meditation on that word, let us pray. Dear Lord, by your wonderful gift of grace, through baptism, you brought us into your family. You washed away our sins and you made us pure and clean. Help us to remember that baptism every single day, as we go through all trials and temptations, to know and recall that wonderful joy that you have given to each of us. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends in Christ, Feet fastened in stocks, blood dried, sticking to their clothes, some still trickling down the back from where they were flogged. Inside a cold, damp, dark cell. How did we get here? Paul and Silas were no stranger to persecution. But yet, it also wasn't an everyday occurrence. The whole incident kicked off when they traveled to the city called Philippi. Things started out well. They went to the place where they expected to find some people praying, a place of prayer they heard about by the river just outside the city, and there they met a woman named Lydia. They taught her about Jesus. Lydia and her household were baptized. Every day they were going out again, preaching, teaching. But then a slave girl started following them. That wasn't just any slave girl. It was a slave girl who had a spirit within her, a spirit that could prophesy the future, and her owners used her to make money. She followed around Paul and Silas and the others saying, Oh, these are men of God. Listen to them. I always say any, any publicity is good publicity. This obviously was not because it was actually detracting from their work, detracting from their preaching. And it got to the point after a few days of this that Paul was, was just so fed up of, of her disrupting their preaching and teaching of Jesus that he turned around and he said, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command that spirit to come out of you. And it did. And the owners of the slave girl suddenly saw the dollar signs evaporate. They're losing a source of income. So they grab Paul and Silas, they drag them before the city magistrates, and they say, these men have been putting our city in an uproar. They are teaching customs that are unlawful for us Roman citizens to practice. And mob mentality, they just all joined in. 
The magistrates, yeah, go ahead. They, they flogged him. They beat them. And then they, they said, secure him in the jail. The jailer came, fastened their feet in stocks, threw them into the inner cell so there is no sunlight, no fresh air. Leave them there. If you were Paul and Silas, what, you, what would you be doing hours after all of that happening? As you were in that prison cell, your body still searing from the pain of the flogging, from the uncomfortableness that comes from having your feet placed in stocks, from now being in this place with all the rest of the, the villainy of this city that no one wants to see the light of day, what would you be doing? Would you silently just accept what has happened to you? Would you complain about it? Would you talk about the injustice? Because let's be honest, that was very unjust. That was completely wrong. There was no law or order to that. That was mob mentality completely persecuting these people for teaching about Jesus. It wasn't fair. Would you talk about how bad the pain is? Trying to commiserate, to hope maybe in some way this might relieve you. Would you just curl up into a fetal position and slowly wince with the pain, waiting for it to be over? We may not have been locked up, beaten, thrown in the stocks, but we know pain. We know all sorts of pain. What do you do when pain comes to you, when pain comes wave after wave, that it is unending, that it does not stop, that it does not go away, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain, what do you do to get through it? Do you do what most of us do, which is just silently resign yourself, like, let's not even talk about this, because I want to try to ignore it and maybe put it out of my head, and maybe I'll forget it for a moment? Is it to talk about it? To commiserate, to, to share with people, this, this does hurt so bad. You need to understand how badly I am hurting. Do we start to get angry with God? Do we look to God and say, God, why have you brought this pain into my life? This doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel fair. And I feel like you are so far from me right now because I'm sitting here suffering through this pain. And you aren't helping. It's like you don't care. And in pain do we grow bitter against God. And say he truly is nowhere to be found. Do we curl up in a fetal position, wince through the pain, and just ask for it to end? How do you get through the pain? Because we all got pain. Some way, shape, or form. What's amazing, though, is Paul and Silas. Blood probably still running down their backs. Here they are at midnight after all this has taken place. And you know what they're doing? They're singing hymns. They are singing songs of praise to God. I mean, I don't know exactly what they were singing. I mean, you would, you would put yourself in a cell like that. What might you sing? What, might, might you have tunes of Amazing grace, how sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I am found Was blind, but now I see Or what about? And when I think that God, my, his son not sparing, 
Send him to die, I scarce can take it in. There on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Or just as we had a couple weeks ago, midnight. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless soul, abide with me. I don't know if they sang. Did they sing one of your favorites? Maybe. Sing something that they were all familiar with? Something that brings you comfort in the deepest, darkest places where there is so much pain? And yet they had joy. Maybe they even sang baptismal songs, songs like what we've already sang this morning, because they were recounting that just a few days ago, it was by the river that they baptized Lydia and her whole family, and they were thinking about how great this is. This family has come to know Christ. They have been washed clean, brought into the family of Christ. Maybe Paul was thinking about his own baptism. You remember Paul, you remember his life before he was a preacher of the gospel. Paul was a persecutor of Christians. He hated Christians. He tried to arrest them and, and sentence them to death. But then Jesus appeared to him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He became blind, was told to go see this man, this Christian man named Ananias. And after he regained his sight, visiting Ananias, he was baptized. He immediately started preaching about Jesus, about what Jesus had done for him, how Jesus had brought him out of this life, had completely turned him around to one who tried to destroy Christianity, to now one who would die for Christianity. Because he knew what God had done for him. It didn't matter the flogging. It didn't matter the dank, cold prison cell. It didn't matter the feet in the stocks. They had joy. Joy that went through the pain. Joy in their baptisms to know what God had done for them, how he had washed away their sins, how God had cleansed them, had sanctified them, made them pure and holy, and had given them an inheritance of heaven, of eternal life with God. They had joy. Even in the midst of pain. So much joy knowing what God had done for them that they could sing while in so much pain. But the story doesn't end there. It's just getting started, really. Because then the big event happens. We're told suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer, who was peacefully sleeping, was jarred awake, came out immediately to see what had happened, saw the doors open, assumed what had happened, that the prisoners had gotten out, they had escaped, and he knew when a prisoner escapes, the one entrusted, the one who was caring for them, has to suffer their punishment. And in a split dissection, the jailer decided, you know what, the pain that's about to come is not something I can bear. It would be better if I died. He draws his sword and he is ready to fall on it. He is ready to commit suicide in that moment rather than face the punishment for letting prisoners go. He's in that much pain, willing to leave his family behind, willing to take his own life rather than endure the pain. 
Paul sees this. He sees the man draw his sword. And to think in Paul's eyes, look at this person. This man cared nothing for him. This man fastened his feet in stocks, cared nothing for his comfort, certainly didn't tend to his wounds. Maybe he fed him, maybe he didn't, maybe he beat him. We don't know. But this is a person who just brought him more pain. But Paul sees through the pain because he knows the joy that the Lord has brought to him. And so he shouts, Stop! Don't do it. Don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer comes before them trembling, goes down to his knees. What must I do to be saved? How do I get out of this? I, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I was ready to take my own life. You can imagine him just shaking there and at that moment, at that hour, Paul and Silas immediately answer, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. And they taught him Jesus. It wasn't, well, you got a lot to make up for, jailer. You got a lot of people that you've hurt and harmed over the years, and you're going to have to go make recommends, and then, then maybe you could be saved. No, instantaneously. Didn't matter what he had done to them. Paul and Silas wanted him to know the joy that they had known, the joy that they could sing even in all of that pain. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Because he's enough. He's all you need. You don't need more than him. He is the only path. He is the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father except through him. He came. He lived his life for us. He lived under the law to keep it for us. In fact, that's why he himself was baptized, not because he had sin that needed to be washed away, but as he says in another point, this, is, this needs to be done to fulfill all righteousness. That Jesus keeps all these laws, and then gives us baptism so that we can have joy through the pain, a joy that never ends, a joy that gets us through, a joy that gives us reason to still praise our God, no matter what is going on. That's what Paul and Silas got to teach the jailer that night. And he thought it was so great the jailer brought Paul and Silas to his home. You know, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., whatever it was. The jailer washed Paul and Silas' wounds. And Paul and Silas taught his whole family. This is so important. I don't care if you're sleeping. I don't care that, that, that you just fell asleep. Wake up. You've got to hear what I just heard. Jesus saves us. And in that moment, in that hour of that night, not only was the jailer baptized, but his entire household, everyone, everyone that night then had the joy of baptism that Paul and Silas sang about. A joy that you would sing about even through the pain. To think this man, who was ready to take his own life, now knows that there is something to live for. That there is joy to have beyond this life. That there is joy even through the pain. God does bring distress into people's lives. And he does it through some pretty amazing ways. Who do you know who needs that joy of baptism to see them through the pain of life? Who do you know needs an unending joy of what God has done for you, that, that through baptism God has washed you, God has cleansed you, God has made you holy, God has made you worthy, God has adopted you into his family, he has covered you with the robes of Christ's righteousness. You are a dearly loved child of God. You know that because of your baptism. You know that because of his gift of baptism. This is not what we do for God. This is what God does for us. 
The joy he gives to us, the certainty in knowing, I am saved. I am going to heaven because of what God has given to me. It's not an act. It's not, not something I have to do. It's a gift to believe in the Lord Jesus and know that I am saved. That's the joy of baptism. That's the joy that caused Paul and Silas to sing while even going through all of that pain. That's the joy that the jailer and his family knew, one that he beamed about as, as they set out a meal and ate to know, I no longer have to ask that question, what must I do to be saved? I've been given the answer. It's so simple. It's so amazing. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That with these waters, combined with the Word of God, by the work of the Holy Spirit, you have been saved. You are made pure and clean before the Lord. You belong to Him, His family, as a dearly loved child of God. That's a joy that allows us to see through the pain and to even sing through the pain. What our God has done for us, to know certainly, without a doubt, I will be saved. Because God has washed me. God has cleansed me. I belong to Him. That's the joy of baptism. It allows us to sing through the pain. Amen.